So you're starting to see money kind of capable of carrying something from an idea to hopefully, ideally, gigaton scale deployment, moving through steps and moving through phases of capital in various tranches, with various risk appetites, with various abilities to de-risk those technologies as time goes on. What I wrote in my piece that I think is important to mention is that if you want to address something as a climate investment, then it needs to, as a first principle, talk about its climate benefit. Welcome to Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast featuring the icons and entrepreneurs of technology, commodities, and finance, ranting on the inadequacies of our systems and riffing on ideas for how to solve them. Together, we examine the questions, are we facing a crisis of information or a crisis of trust? And will building smarter markets be the antidote? Welcome to our new series, Financing the Energy Transition on Smarter Markets. I'm Dave Greeley, Chief Economist at ABEX Technologies. Our guest today is Nathaniel Ballard. Nat is a senior contributor to Bloomberg NEF, as well as a venture partner at Voyager Ventures. He writes weekly for Bloomberg Green on energy, transport, technology, climate, and finance. We'll start off our new series by exploring with Nat the size of the investment that's happening in the energy transition, where it's coming from, and where it's going to. Hello, Nat. Welcome to Smarter Markets. Dave, a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for leading off our series on financing the energy transition. Over the past couple of years, there have been so many net zero commitments made, and there have been so many billions of dollars committed to investing in the energy transition. But it's not always clear how those dollars are connecting through to building the physical infrastructure that will enable the energy transition to a net zero economy. I thought you wrote a really great piece earlier this year at Bloomberg titled Energy Transitions, Big Dollars, Big Themes. And I thought that would be a great place for us to jump off. Can you walk us through some of the financial channels you're seeing by which these big dollars are flowing through the capital markets to help finance the energy transition? Certainly. So let's start with the, the scope and scale. So last year, and mind you, we're recording now in November. So this, these are numbers that are almost 10 months old. Last year was about $750 billion, give or take, of investment in energy transition. That's in power generation, renewables, it's in electrified transport, and then it's in a fairly long tail of other things such as hydrogen, heat, some sort of circular economy related investment, and even investment, we would, we would put nuclear power into that category as well. It's grown significantly over time. When I began doing this, it was more in the range of about $50 billion in the mid-2000s, late 2000s. Uh, we're now at about four and a bit trillion dollars that's been invested over the last 15 years or so. And it's becoming a significant number, I think. What's important to do is to sort of separate it in a couple of planes. The first is how much of that money is flowing into renewable power versus everything else. And renewable power has been bouncing around it's below $400 billion for several years. Um, it, it has sort of hit a plateau, at least in the meantime, not necessarily in a bad way, and I'll get to that. Transportation, on the other hand, is approaching $300 billion a year, and that's almost entirely electric vehicles. Um, there's also a small component underneath that of just energy storage in general. And then all of the rest of that stuff is sort of more in the range of about $100 billion total. So it's not an insignificant number, um, but all of it needs to grow really substantially if you were wanting to do a really deep decarbonization. So sort of move from, think of it as an energy transition set of strategies and companies and towards real decarbonization of the global economy. You'd probably want to triple or probably quadruple rather that top line of all of those things. So you're going to need like 2.7 times more renewables, like three and a bit more times more transport, and you're going to need almost 10 times more of everything else in the stuff that has historically been very difficult to do for technical reasons to really decarbonize things like steel production, cement production, the electrification of heat, things of that nature. So that's sort of the, the, where the numbers go. Where it comes from, I think, is also worth looking at because you definitely see a lot of attention to the sort of the early stage elements of, of capital raising. So that's like climate technology and the venture stage and private equity is about $50 billion a year. You look at the activity in SPACs, pipe deals, uh, and IPOs last year, which is a fairly active market, but $110 billion. 
There's obviously equity at the company level that flows into most of what's happening in, in any of these different sectors. But two things are important to note. One is that almost all of the money actually finances assets with financing physical build of something. And two, most of that follows a fairly established project finance modality. So you've got a component of equity, you've got a much larger component of debt, and that's generally the way that long dated assets with fixed contracts get built. So hopefully that sketches out a little bit about sort of like, like where it goes, but also how it goes in terms of flows into uh, energy transition and decarbonization. Absolutely. And you mentioned renewables as kind of one of the sectors that was is receiving the most investment dollars. What are some of the other sectors where the money's going? And in particular, how much does scale matter? You mentioned that there's money flowing into some of the early stage startups, but I imagine a lot of it's going into like the, the large scale deployments of That's right. solar wind. Um, exactly. Most of the money that we see flowing, um, I, I, I want to say that it's roughly about like $9 out of every 10 really in the investment realm for these assets is going towards building something. It's going towards actually creating an asset that goes into the ground. That's where most of the capital flows. And of that, about half of it in total is going towards just renewable power generation. And within that, almost all of it is going really to wind and solar. So we've, we've got a, a, a sort of a continually narrowing funnel in terms of where money is typically going. What's interesting about that is, you know, I mentioned that that, that figure is kind of like tapping out. And it's actually not necessarily a bad thing. In the long run, you want that number to be probably in the order of more than a trillion dollars a year. And the declines that we've seen have been this sort of combination, this triangulation of both the falling capital cost of assets and money deployed. So you're getting more out of every dollar that is being deployed, which means that even if you have sort of relatively flat or not hugely growing dollars in terms of deployment, uh, the dollars invested rather, you're seeing more assets deployed for that same money. And I'm curious, have you seen this pattern of of sectoral investment changing in recent years? It's, um, yes, absolutely. And you look at a lot of technologies, and I'm curious if you see certain sectors that you would say are being underinvested in. So transport, and remember, we include vehicles as a sort of quasi fixed asset in this case. They're at least longer dated than consumer packaged goods or white goods even. It's really transport where things are taking off. And I remember a couple of years ago, I sat down with our transport team at BNEF and we tried to sort of game out at what point we would have more dollars invested in transportation than invested in clean energy. And it's fairly elastic depending upon the demand for, for electric vehicles. But we're probably not far off in a year or two, maybe three, before most of the dollars that are flowing are going into EVs and some of the related energy storage investment that goes with it. As far as where we're probably not devoting enough, I think the early stage of things that were really considered kind of science experiment or maybe science fiction level decarbonization approaches is where we definitely need to see more money if we want to see a lot of activity. And that's in what in the parlance you would call hard to abate sectors. So that's things like cement production, chemicals, steel, aluminum production, places where you start to run into chemistry problems and not just physics problems, so to speak, where you actually have molecular balances that you have to maintain, where you have extremely high needs for heat and very high needs for the quality of that heat, things like that. There's another area, and this is becoming very apparent right now in Europe in the current series of crises kicked off by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which is in heat of all sorts as something that needs to be decarbonized. And some of it is as prosaic as just replacing the home boiler with a heat pump. Other elements of it are going much further into industrial heat production, which I, I think most of your listeners will be aware is an extremely big proportion of global energy demand. But it's also a very demanding portion of demand, so to speak. Like you need to hit certain qualities of heat for certain durations with certain stability in ways that really cannot be converted into intermittency or variability. And so I think that that's where structurally, I wouldn't say that we're necessarily fundamentally underinvested because this is really quite new, but we are definitely in need of much more investment to come. And you wrote a really interesting article for Bloomberg last week, I believe, 
where you discuss the rapid development of climate capital at all scales from early stage venture to multi-billion dollar infrastructure and the funding available for climate tech and climate oriented businesses and projects. How are you seeing climate focused investing evolving and connecting with and funding these climate oriented businesses? It's a really good question, right? It, it's sort of a, it, it's kind of like a running, a running uh, theme for anybody investing in climate specifically is to look at something, a portfolio, an asset, a company, a business model and ask, is this a climate investment or not? It's in fact a little bit of a running joke that we have with some of the people that I, that I talk to frequently. And I thought that it needed a bit of specification, but it didn't need to necessarily be narrowed down. So the venture landscape is very healthy. I think we would say it is still very healthy in terms of active fundraising. There's a great deal of inbound interest from founders. And there's a lot of LP interest, which is uh, obviously where you want to be if you're on the front and sharp end of things. There's plenty of interest in, in creating new technologies, addressing these challenging questions. And then what's really important is that we're starting to see the money that gets laddered on top of that to step these assets from sort of experiment to lab bench to fab to massive deployment. So you see things such as Brookfield or Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners launching what they would call an energy transition fund. And you can think of it as like the deployment capital for the long run of building assets that one way or another are going to decarbonize. You've got interest from sovereign funds. Tamasek in particular has a big play here in addressing not just challenges around infrastructure, but even increasingly challenges around things such as recycling or even trying to decarbonize or demethanize rather the production of rice, which is both a huge source of emissions and a huge source of calories, in particular in Southeast Asia. And then you've got things such as the Loan Programs Office at the Department of Energy here, which has been, how should we say, revivified you know, at scale, thanks to both the activities of, it, of its director, but also the new funding that has come from the Inflation Reduction Act. So you're starting to see money kind of capable of carrying something from an idea to hopefully, ideally, gigaton scale deployment, moving through steps and moving through phases of capital in various tranches, with various risk appetites, with various abilities to de-risk those technologies as time goes on. What I wrote in my piece that I think is important to mention is that if you want to address something as a climate investment, then it needs to, as a first principle, talk about its climate benefit. And that probably is in the range of what emissions is it avoiding? What process is it improving to what degree that we can measure in a climate way? And what kind of scale does it hope to achieve? So I think that that's a very important thing to put in because otherwise we have the potential for a sort of looseness in defining whether or not something counts as climate, because if it in any way has something to do with emissions, you could consider it to be a climate investment. I think that if we're going to call all these new pools of capital and their investment approaches a climate investment approach, then it needs to very specifically address that element of what those companies intend to do. And how much of, of is there the overlap between what you would call climate and what people would look at as a carbon project. And one of the things with carbon projects, of course, is that it's measurable. And so sometimes right. it's easier to measure the benefits relative to other climate type benefits. So you're, you're talking here about, say, a carbon removal project like direct air capture or something That's like right. that? Or, okay. So there's definitely a series of different things that we can talk about for reducing carbon, right? One is Probably the simplest to measure is also one of the hardest to do, which is build a system, a physical system that withdraws atmospheric carbon dioxide and one form or another secures it on a ideally multi-century timeline so that it no longer enters the atmospheric carbon cycle. As I say, relatively easy to measure, <laughs> very hard to do. Uh, and if it can be done, it's generally quite expensive. Then there would be something like, let's say, using a natural carbon sink, such as afforestation or reforestation, wherein you can measure the uptake of carbon into the living things, into the into wood biomass. 
and with some assumptions, you know, make the case that it's absorbed this much carbon. Now, that unfortunately can be very highly contingent upon things outside the developer's control, such as, say, a drought and a wildfire that <laughs> causes that ostensibly sunk carbon to literally go back up in smoke. And then there is probably the, the next phase is looking at what in the UN language they would have called additionality, more or less, which is if I am building an offshore wind farm in the North Sea, what is the counterfactual to that? What would have happened otherwise to create that same 200 gigawatt hours of power per year? And you would probably look at what the grid is and sort of assess it as a delta based on that. So the grid is a small percentage coal, it's a lot of nuclear and a lot of natural gas and a lot of renewables. So you would basically be you're evaluating it based on what otherwise would have happened in this counterfactual fashion. And you mentioned earlier that there's still a lot of interest, still a lot of money available, even at the, you know, the the venture moving from the the lab bench to, you know, scaling up the fabrication stage. What are the ty- is there are there certain areas that are more attractive to investors right now whether it's you know doing things that are more nature based as you said doing things that are more technologically based even going outside carbon to nuclear or like what are the what are the areas that are attracting interest amongst investors so in early stage I think there is inherently an interest towards things that can that can grow and scale very quickly so there's there, there, there's interest in process improvements, a lot of interest in software where, where it has a direct impact on, on operating systems. There's also interest, frankly, in software as software. So things such as uh, accounting or um, management of flows and, and carbon flows and things like that. So that's definitely, I think, with it, within the realm of traditional venture. Scaling up a bit, there's a lot of interest in call it the relatively light infrastructure, the endpoint infrastructure of advanced transportation uh, and of energy storage, wherein there's, again, a play that has a kind of technological basis to it or a specific business model approach. It is interesting that we see quite a lot of funding interest at the institutional level now for things such as such as nuclear. We, I think, do not see enough interest because it's highly contingent upon policy and regulation and planning and permission in things such as transmission, uh, in things such as you know bu- building this sort of connective network that will bring all of this new capacity to the market. I think another area that that, that is is attracting interest and I think needs to attract a lot more is where we think about the intersection of climate and food and agriculture. I mean this is a this is a part of the global emissions pie that is very very hard to address. It's very highly distributed. The data are not necessarily great. It is mission critical to get it right um, to make sure that things are are edible and sustainable. And so we're beginning to see a lot of interest there, but it's, I, I think it's still fairly nascent. You, you could make the argument that some of the, the synthetic protein of the meat sub or the meat substitute foods that we've seen are in one way or another something climate related because they're very directly uh, avoiding like for like the emissions that would come from a similar quantum of ground beef or of ground pork. But there's a lot more to do and many more things to address. And I'd like to move up from the the venture to the the more institutional managers that you mentioned. Obviously, the mainstreaming of ESG has been a, a huge yep. thing over the recent years. But then recently, you know, we've seen climate activists protesting at BlackRock, while at the right. same time, the state of Texas is having its pension funds divest their investments with BlackRock because of its ESG stance. So kind of getting it from both sides there. How do you see this sort of activism from either side impacting investment in the energy transition? And I guess more specifically, on balance, is ESG increasing or constraining investment at this point? No, I think this is this is a really important thing for us to query a little bit. And, and I always start by saying that like, if we were to build brand new risk screens today, would we knowing what we know and with the data we have available, would we somehow group environmental things that are inherently measurable with social things that are harder to measure and maybe not necessarily as related with governance, which in a sense is probably and should be just a component of all good corporate operations. 
And the answer is, I don't think that we necessarily would. I think we would probably be atomizing these into separate groups. It's very complex, I think, to try to analyze all of these things together. And I think it also leaves it leaves it leaves very clear and apparent climate related risk screening, one way or another, grouped in with stuff that can become quite a bit of a political football. And that I think is where you find institutional fund managers in this challenging position of they could be setting up in one in one element a very rigorously defined asset and infrastructure investment thesis that in a sense doesn't really need ESG within it to exist at all. It's simply going to have risk-adjusted returns above whatever baseline they're assuming. uh, And it happens to be invested in things that are largely decarbonization related versus all the other activity that it might be measuring that is far more social, that is far more contentious, certainly, I think, publicly. And I think that it, it would benefit in a way to sort of have these atomized again. So that this is a fund that doesn't, it isn't predicated upon ESG. It's simply predicated upon risk adjusted, you know, risk adjusted returns above your benchmark that happen to be best met from doing these kinds of activities that happen to be decarbonization related. Now, is it, is it actually impairing capital flow? I don't think so yet, because you simply have a lot of institutional investors further up the ladder. You have the limited partners of a lot of these institutions, or you have pensions themselves that have their own mandates that simply see this as doing good business for themselves and are are willing to sort of ride through it. I think what's going to be really important for us to watch is what the portfolio performance impact is of making these large divestments at the moment. You know, if you think about BlackRock, BlackRock has an ESG fund if you want to buy it. They also have funds that are things such as, you know, basically the shale patch, and you can invest in those as you like and and see your return or your particular stance reflected in that decision. So I, I don't think that it's materially impacting inflows yet. But it is complicating the thought process for sure. And it's injecting political complication in a way that I I can't imagine most big investment managers are interested in having to entertain. And I'd like to to switch over there from talking about investment policy to government policy, which you've brought up a couple of times now, because of course, there's a lot of government influence in financing the energy transition as well. And I'm curious, how big of a role do you think that's playing right now? And you know, with the passage of the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, what do you think that's going to do for climate investment? So what, one thing that I like to emphasize is that there is really not such a thing as a completely free market in energy anywhere. It is simply neutral statement, too large, too embedded, and too strategic in any economy for it to be left purely to market forces. You know, whether that's the Texas Railroad Commission back in the day determining how much oil could be sent so that you don't have price wars forever, or it's a public utility commission regulating rates of return or setting rules for interconnection uh, or making determinations on the proper mix in an integrated resource plan. We have always had a strong hand of policy and regulation in markets. I think that that's just the feature of them rather than a bug. That said, I think that we're entering a period of a much more muscular approach at the highest level of policy for a number of reasons in markets. And one is that the strategic element of this is just brought much more to the fore by what is happening in Europe. You know, certainly decisions that were made, by the way, themselves generally out of some kind of notion of national security. Germany importing gas from Russia to sort of ensure that there would be peace between parties <laughs> is um, now, I think, been inverted quite a bit to having to meet demand as insofar as possible without disrupting regular everyday life and industrial business while also trying to decarbonize and while also trying to minimize importation is just a a case where governments have to come roaring back into play. And I think it's also a place where I don't know that we would expect a private market to ever 
fully embody all of the things that need doing because they exist at a level sort of beyond the ring fence of how a board of directors is going to make its own decisions. So, you know, you can talk about policies to sort of set emissions targets in Europe. There was the fit, fit for 55 in the EU that, that, that was passed a, a little while ago. You then have more near-term things, such as policies to sort of flood the zone with heat pumps so that you aren't relying on gas heating at home and you can save whatever gas is available for industry until you decarbonize that. And then in the United States, we have things like not just the Inflation Reduction Act, but the Chips and Science Act that are industrial policy and decarbonization policy and economic redistribution to some extent and jobs policy all wrapped into one in a complex way, but I think generally speaking in an accretive and in a sensible way too, with a lot of implementation to come, with a lot of devils in a lot of details, let's say. And do you see the the Inflation Reduction Act in the US as being a, a game changer or at least a strong accelerator? Let's see. I think that by hopefully spurring on a great deal of infrastructure build, and this is mostly in the form of transmission, it allows what developers of assets want to do to happen. It gives them the sort of way to work to fruition. There is just an insane amount of clean power planned in the national uh, interconnection queues, like in excess of 600 gigawatts, which is about half as much capacity, again, as exists in all of the US right now of everything, most of which will never get built unless you find ways to connect it. So that, I think, is one way of changing the game. The other is somewhat a bit animal spirits, and I'm sure you've already noticed this, which is that the passage of the IRA has kind of given license to expand to companies that might previously have been in a wait and see mode for elements of the US market. So that's definitely the case for battery manufacturing expansion in the US, relatedly uh, auto electric vehicle auto manufacturing in the US, but also things that are that are in that in those difficult and harder to abate parts of the world, things where you're dealing in the world of, of chemistry more than you are dealing in the world of electrons. And so I think it is it it has sort of widened what we would call, you know, back in the day, the Overton window of like what's sort of, you know, what's sort of acceptable to be viewed and approached. And it has widened the lens on what is possible. So I do think, I do think that it is already changing the game. But implementation of this is going to be extremely important. Like if funds don't flow efficiently, if there's a great deal of sort of capture by one group or another that 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 is a sort of unintended consequence of who lobbies best i think that would be a little bit unfortunate but i definitely think that it has changed the engagement and changed the sense of scale of what's going to be possible certainly from an emissions perspective if in that, you know if, if we do all the things that are allowed through the inflation reduction act we'll find ourselves not quite on target for our paris agreements but definitely much closer than we would be otherwise. Right. And when we look outside the US, and you had mentioned, you know, we talked a little bit about Europe, and certainly European energy policies come under a lot of scrutiny recently for its contribution to the current energy crisis there. Uh, even a story of a, a wind farm being dismantled in Germany to make room for a, a coal mine expansion, you know, not a good look and not the direction right. for the energy transition. Right. Uh, certainly not a good symbolic uh, news story to have out there. I'm curious, maybe outside the US, outside of Europe, what do you see as the state of climate policy? And are there some success stories happening out there? So I think that, you know, you know, China's policy is sui generis. It is, it is hard to separate from the larger economic goals of the five-year plan or whatever the, the, the government's own larger goals for not just infrastructure, but technology deployment are. Definitely, it's sort of an extraordinary success in terms of what it's been able to deploy on its own. I think India has done very well. It, it's probably going to miss its nearest term targets for renewable deployment, but will move ahead further. I'm very interested to see what India commits to at the upcoming COP27 in Egypt, because it was sort of the, it was one of the last holdouts to avoid making an emissions peak or a net zero target commitment for, I think, defensible reasons of its own development. But I'm curious to see how that plays. In particular, the spike in commodity prices 
has the knock-on effect of making renewable power in particular more in the money, even if its own costs are going up. Just something we observed over the summer when when when, when uh, BNEF last ran the research, which was that you know you saw upticks thanks to cost of capital and cost of capital equipment for wind and solar at a, at a global benchmark level uh, when we did this assessment in in the summer. But at the same time, rising cost of gas and the rising cost of coal meant that. The delta, the positive delta for renewables was never wider against uh, against gas in particular than over the course of the summer. It's given, I think it's given a lot more room for deployment of zero marginal cost, zero fuel power generation in particular to kind of come in and occupy a bigger and bigger chunk of global power demand on an economic basis, not so much a policy basis. So that that's something that I think we, we we're observing closely. I think transportation too is very interesting, though in ways that uh, that that are hard to see sitting where we are. So there's going to be a little under two million barrels a day of displaced oil demand thanks to EVs in 2022. More than half of that is coming from two and three wheeled vehicles in Asia. <laughs> So it's not coming from buses or trucks or or Teslas or ID fours. It's coming from little things that honestly we can't even really buy here if we want to. And I think of this as sort of like a a, a bit of a sleeper for most people who look at these markets in the sense that I'm trying to imagine what today's oil market would be like if we had to meet another almost two million barrels per day of oil demand in the current market as it is. And I think that. We're approaching moments, and, and and I'm channeling a bit with the IEA wrote the other day, uh, last week rather, which is that we're kind of beginning to dance around the peak for demand for a number of inputs, in fact, pretty much all of them, to industrial economy that needs hydrocarbons, oil, coal, and natural gas. The IEA has called last week in its conservative scenario for what I think they call a, quote, definitive peak in fossil fuel demand, which is pretty important when you consider that this is not coming from its ultra, sort of its 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 ultra decarbonization scenario, or even its countries are going to do what they say they're going to do, announce the pledges scenario. This is in a sort of closest as we can get to business as usual. No major technological changes, no major policy changes. Simply, we're probably at the moment where we're close to the peak and we're at the peak rather in emissions from from the power sector. We're going to approach peak demand for coal and for oil, natural gas as well, though that is expected in their scenario to probably hit a plateau and stay there. But this is very significant, I think. And in particular, coming from the IEA, which, you know, if we think about it from its charter, was simply designed to sort of maintain the mechanics of energy security largely in in the rich world in the OECD. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because you know when you look out at the the news flow right now, you know the the IEA with their world energy outlook certainly struck a more positive outlook, particularly if you look out 5 10 years down the road. Of course at the same time, you know they pointed out that in 2021 I think we added 1.9 billion tons of CO2 emissions to the annual total, bringing it up to 36 some. So, you know, on the one hand, coming out of the the pandemic, we've had the largest annual increase in CO2 emissions. You know, a lot of moving back to coal-fired generation in Europe this year and globally. But you know, as you said, looking, you know, if, if government policymakers can keep to their path, something like a plateau in fossil fuel use five, ten years out. So you have the IEA striking a more positive outlook. You've got the UN Climate Office came out with, I think what you'd say is a fairly bleak new report stating that That's the world generous. is- I think it was more that it was, it was extremely bleak uh, yeah. in the way that it was it was arranged and presented. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to ask you about that because you know, the, the, the UN is saying we're nowhere near hitting its uh, our Paris Agreement climate targets. And so when you're looking at you know all these different views from you know big world organizations, Maybe like taking a step back, how are you assessing the state of the energy transition right now in terms of the scale of the new low carbon energy supply that we're bringing online? So the 
it's just, you're right that this is this is sort of like oddly complex. That depending uh, you, you know on what set of glasses you put on, you either see an extraordinary amount of progress, an amazing plateau that I, nobody was expecting a few years ago, especially not to be propounded by the IEA, or a dismal state in which we're not doing anything right. So I'll, I'll work backwards from the dismal one. I, I, this is entirely true that we are not on track for, from the many different measures that you could use specific to each sector to reach 1.5 degree scenario. Like this is now at the point where you need how shall I say, almost like economic collapse level of typical decarbonization to happen year on year on year uh, in order for that to happen in a near term. So if if even COVID-19 in 2020 didn't drive emissions down that much, then it's it's an awful lot to ask of the technologies and the capital suite that we have available today to do so. So that's the one thing. But the other is that the the scale of change that we're approaching right now is something that I think people don't often apprehend, uh, in particular because we're at that point where, where all of this activity that's happening in decarbonization has simply bent somewhat invisibly the increasing curve that has been existing to date. But we're going to, so the world's going to have, and this is the IEA's numbers here, around 460 terawatt hours of new solar and wind generation this year. This is part of why they said that, well, what I think emissions were up 1.9 billion tons last year, they're only going to be up about 300 million this year. But that 460 or so terawatt hours is the same amount of power as France consumes in a year. And France is the 10th biggest power economy in the world. Next year, if you factor in the installation of 251 gigawatts of solar PV this year, plus about 93 gigawatts of wind power, plus about 13 gigawatts of offshore wind power. It's closer to like 650 gigawatt hours or terawatt hours rather that's going to be going to be added incrementally to the power system next year. That's more than Brazil, which is the sixth largest power economy in the world, consumes. We're, we're getting to the point where the incremental year on year are now more than 1% of global power demand that is being decarbonized. And it's really important because at a certain point, those rates of increase, if they're not matched by a subsequent top line rate of increase, mean that you have to start eroding a market somewhere else for something. And so you, you're, going to, you're going to hit these, not only hit the peaks, but you're going to have very stiff competition for each of these resources on its own that has peaked for... The, the declining share of the, of the fossil fuel margin of generation in any given system. Are we there yet for oil? Uh, very hard to say. But again, you know, we'll be able to calculate by the end of this year what 2023's uh, demand uh, displacement in oil is from electric vehicles. And it's again, it's 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 a number that we're where the top line is still growing and it's simply reducing the rate of growth makes it hard to see. But when it tips things into actual system change, I think it's gonna become very dramatic. So I'm I'm sort of I'm not as negative as the as the UN report is, though I understand the purpose that it's trying to meet, which is that we have set ourselves this goal and this target, and we are nowhere close to meeting it. That's true. What I tend to spend my time looking at is like, what are we doing and how might we expect that to go forward in the future? You know, like how can we watch the fact that we're going to be in a couple of years, 15% renewable power globally, which means that you know, that's more than, I think that's probably more than any given country besides China and it's in its share of global power generation. And how are we going to match the fact that we, you know, that growth without the same top line growth in power means that it's got to erode demand for something else with another possibility, which is that if we want to really decarbonize, we probably need to more or less triple the amount of power generated globally by the middle of the century. That means you could either build more coal and use it to uh, energize your electric vehicle, or you can build just orders of magnitude more of the things that are already on the way to decarbonizing power and working their way into all those sectors that have been hard to do in the past for all the reasons we've already discussed. All right. And it's a bit of, you know, we're, we're getting towards, you know, potentially net zero growth, but we need to get to net right. zero levels. 
And that's right. a that's a big exactly. Task. But I think it's I think it's really important, you know, if you if you think about industries as growth and how they're valued and how capital planning goes to consider the implications of that. If you make very long, if if you're going to make a deep water offshore final investment decision for oil, what is it predicated on? Is it predicated on on rising demand? Is it predicated on that resource being the cheapest barrel on the margin in the market? Is it predicated upon other sets of things we could layer in there? Is it more secure, more ethical, which is an argument that we've seen made, and, and I don't actually fundamentally have a problem with that. Is it is it more secure as supply? Uh, is it a, a diversifying um, one's global supply, or is it consolidating uh, among friends, so to speak? But it all requires, if the market is not growing, a much more enhanced focus on any one of those particular aspects in a way that when demand was growing more than a million barrels a day, fine. You know, it's not really a concern. You're planning an asset into a growth cycle that you anticipate will continue to pay literal and figurative dividends for a very long time. When that's not the case, then we have uh, you know, a, a cram down essentially in terms of the economics of operation. We see that in periods of relatively slack demand and how challenging it is for uh, much of the high cost production as it is. Some of it gets curtailed, is rarely, I guess, suppose it gets shut in, but you're going to face that possibility becoming more, more acute every year. And I think that's going to be very challenging for any number of different reasons. How do you plan your new assets? How do you run the ones that you have? What do you run them for? Do you run them for growth? You know, do you run them for cash? All these sorts of things. And I think I'd like to, you know, close this out today by getting your thoughts on, you know, in the spirit of moving forward, and this is a process and, you know, there are some important notable gains that are being made. What are we doing well right now in terms of financing the energy transition and getting those projects in place that'll help us get to net zero? And what do you think we can be doing better? So what are we doing? What are we doing well? Uh, we're doing well at giving money to stuff that works. <laughs> Which sounds like a bit of a circular <laughs> argument. And in fact, it is a bit of circular logic. Why are these things receiving money? Because they're bankable. Why are they bankable? Because they generally receive money. So that's one thing we do well is we, I think, have a very good sense of following, uh, following a trend once it has sort of reached a, uh, an established point. People buy EVs because they're, past, you know, they're now past 10% of global new auto sales. And they've been sort of de-risked collectively in people's mind. Not that there aren't risks, not that there won't be complications, but people have sort of collectively made the decision that this is a path we're going to go down, whether it's from the personal buying decision to the capital equipment and tooling decision for, an, for the automakers themselves. And power, you know, renewables tend to be the cheapest in most new grids. Uh, they also deploy quickly. They deploy in relatively smaller, if they want, tranches of capital deployed. So that, I think, has a way of of sort of maintaining its own gravity while also offering the chance for acceleration. I think what can we do better? So one of them is one thing is to just really be dedicated to solving hard problems. So that's looking past cycles and into the sort of imperative of deeply decarbonizing steel, aluminum, cement production. These things on their own are like large country sized greenhouse gas emitters. They're relatively concentrated. The companies that, that operate them are generally very big. They have interest within both their financial and their social license to operate, to decarbonize, but they're going to need help. They're going to need government commitment. They're going to need R&D. And then the final thing, and, and I'm drawing on some very good research that I would urge any listener to find, which is from the Oxford Institute for New Economic Thinking. And it was an examination of basically 50 years worth of experience curves for technologies like wind, solar, lithium-ion batteries, and hydrogen electrolyzers matched up against the assessment models that the large canonical institutions, governments, and for the most part, oil majors have done in forecasting the future. And this research does an extremely nice job of kind of squaring a circle for me, which is that historically, all models tend to assume that like the present can't go on forever. The current conditions of growth, or wherever we are, are reliable, but not 
indefinite, and we should probably apply some kind of floor cost to add to assets on a unit basis and a sort of ceiling on deployment based on whatever gim crackery you have in the model that says, well, there's no way we're going to be able to deploy this much of that. So let's just assume it flattens out. So Oxford went through this research and, and they attacked the first part, uh, the, the, the floor cost first, which is with five decades worth of analysis, there's no evidence for floor costs. This is now peer reviewed research. Like we do not see evidence for a floor cost for these distributed technologies and we will not apply them. So that in and of itself is big. Now it, it's a bit bonkers if you're used to sort of assuming that things eventually have to hit a hit, hit some layer at which they no longer get cheaper. And mind you, they will probably have an asymptotic approach to that point. So you know the the, the rate at which they're getting cheaper definitely slows down. But the research would suggest that we shouldn't we shouldn't arbitrarily say that's it. Like it's not going to get any cheaper than where we are right now. And they also basically sort of urge us to not sort of artificially constrain what the market could be. So as I said, 251 gigawatts of solar this year is much more than has ever been built of any one technology in a year ever for power generation. And it's also nowhere close to actually what the market itself is planning to do. So it's sort of a matter of where we look. If we look at polysilicon production, which is kind of the rate determining production element for making solar panels, by 2025, we'll have somewhere north of 900 gigawatts worth of annual production capacity available. So the market, companies are already planning to do that. They're planning to be capable of meeting that. And you sort of have to suspend disbelief a little bit if you want to follow what otherwise I think is a pretty evidentiary and logical chain of events to get us to a future where we can be doing double or triple the amount of somewhere that we're doing right now, because to an extent, companies have willed that into being. Provided there's capital available, provided that the rest of the economy is stable enough for things to deploy, provided you have all of these other assisting uh, or determining steps such as transmission and planning and permission and trade and everything in place, then this is definitely within the realm of possible. And finding an arbitrary reason to shut it down has sort of been viewed almost as like a good practice back in the day as a way of not sounding like you were completely nuts. But I would urge us not to preemptively apply such things because these markets have traditionally blown right past them with sort of no disregard for what the integrated assessment model says. And companies themselves are in their own interest to expand as much as possible, try to grab market share, and allow us this ability to sort of really move down the curve, you know, in three, you know, two, three, four percent per year decarbonization of the global power system. Thanks again to Nat Ballard. Senior Contributor to Bloomberg NEF and Venture Partner at Voyager Ventures. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Join us next week when our series continues with guest Nikita Singhal, Co-Head of Sustainable Investment and ESG at Lazard Asset Management. This episode has been brought to you in part by Base Carbon. The trading of carbon credits can help companies and the world meet ambitious goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But how do we judge the quality of these projects And how can we ensure that our investments are creating real value? At Base Carbon, we're focused on financing and facilitating the transition to net zero through trusted and transparent partners. It's time to focus on what's important. It's time to get serious on carbon. Learn more at basecarbon.com. That concludes this week's episode of Smarter Markets by ABAX. For episode transcripts and additional episode information, including research, editorial, and video content, please visit smartermarkets.media. Please help more people discover the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform. Smarter Markets is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Smarter Markets should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Smarter Markets are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or producer. Smarter Markets, its hosts, guests, employees and producer, ABAX Technologies, 
shall not be held liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on informational viewpoints presented on Smarter Markets. Thank you for listening and please join us again next week.